We are going to be in Colossians, and so I invite you to turn there with me to Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity to, st to study one of my favorite books. It's the, the first book of the Bible that I memorized. Uh, coincidentally, it's also the last book that I memorized. Memorization is, is hard and it's challenging, and to do that across one entire book, uh, I really admire those that can do it. Um, but let's stand together. We're Colossians chapter 1, and uh, for our text this morning, I'll be reading 1 through 14, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, this is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you were previously heard of which you previously heard in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all of the world also has been constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood it, the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the, in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning would be an encouragement to us as we desire to live uprightly before you and as we think of the things that you have done for us, I pray that it indeed would be an encouragement to persevere in the faith that we have received. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and be seated if you are standing. I know what you're thinking. I, I read all of that, and you're telling yourself there's no way that this guy's going to get through uh, 14 verses, and you're absolutely right. We're not going to do it, but these, these two uh, sections of Scripture are so closely linked that we're going to look at them both under the heading, uh, The Heart of Intercession, because that's really what Paul is revealing. He, he's talking to the Colossian church. He is, he is trying to encourage them and to uh, commend them, and he's trying to teach them. Uh, but at the heart of it, we see the heart of an intercessor, someone who wants to see the church grow and, and to, to bear fruit in spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so he is, he is praying for them. But before we get to the praying for them portion, uh, he reminds them of the things uh, that he prays that he's, he's thankful to God for. So it's, it's, it's a section on uh, praying in thanksgiving. Uh, it's a prayer of, of praise. And then we get into next week, uh, the prayer of intercession. And so what we look at when we read Paul interacting with the church, like most of his letters, uh, they are in the form of a prayer in his beginning. He, he has an introduction where he tells them not only that he is praying for them, but what he is praying for them, what he wants to see happen, what he wants to see take place. And, and that's how you know that his pledge of prayer is sincere. Because it isn't just a, 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 a prayer that's, that's cast. It's not just one prayer for all of the churches. So we see that Paul's heart goes out to each church that he ministers to. And it isn't some kind of a formula or a form prayer that he would insert into an introduction that we can kind of brush aside and just say, well, that's just Paul. He always says that sort of thing. No, no, his, his prayers for the churches are unique to the situation that is taking place in that church. And that's what we see in Colossae. We see the heart of an intercessor as he prays for their circumstances, as he prays for the challenges that they're going to face, as he praises God for the victories that they experience. And so he prays uniquely for the needs of the church. Let me ask you this morning, who prays for you? If I, if I could ask you that, per, that question directly, you would come up with a long list. Uh, probably you would say your parents and your grandparents. Uh, you might even say your siblings, your brothers and sisters in the flesh. You might even say your, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You would talk. for me. 
And then the question is, what do these people all have in common? Well, the answer is that they want what's best for you because they, they love you and they care for you. They, they desire that God's best would be a part of your life. And so they, they pray for you. And, and in doing so, they pray all kinds of prayers. They, they're going to pray for your health and your safety. They're going to pray for your future and for your success. They're going to pray for your, your spouse and your, your kids. They're going to pray for the things that matter to you. And they're going to pray for you as you make decisions. Most importantly, they're going to pray for your salvation. They're going to pray ongoingly for your relationship with Jesus. And so when it comes to that last one, the, the prayer of salvation, the, the prayer is usually that you would know and that you would love and that you would follow Jesus. And sometimes this becomes the hardest prayer because those uh, prayers can also be the ones that, that start with whatever it takes, Jesus. When, when there is someone that we love, someone that we care for, but whether it's a parent or a spouse or a son or a daughter, or a dear friend, and we see them wandering away from the faith and they are persisting in selfishness and a rebellious heart toward God. And we, we've exhausted all of the gentle prayers. Lord, lead them and guide them and, and direct them. And, and, and we, we fall to our knees and we cry out and we say, Jesus, do whatever it takes to save them. Whatever it takes, Lord, bring them to the end of themselves. Bring them to the end of this road that they're going down and bring them to the end of all of their self-sufficiency and all of their, their selfishness and all of these things that are, 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 are tearing them apart. Bring them to the end of themselves and bring them to you. I think about the parable of the, the prodigal son and if the, if the father seeing his son squandering everything that he had and, and losing himself in loose living so that he is feeding the pigs and, and he's seeing that the pigs are, are better fed than he is. I don't think that the father looking at his son in that moment would have, would have said to himself, well, I hope that he finds himself a good wife one day. And maybe if he does this for a couple more years, he'll get that promotion and one day he'll be the head pig feeder. I, I, I don't think that's his prayer. And his prayer would be, Father, I want, I, I want my son back. And of course we know that, that the Father in that story represents our Heavenly Father. And his desire is that we would come back. And when we wander, when we stray, when we lose our way in the faith, he says, no, my son, I want you to come back. And so he puts that burden on those that love you, those that want the best for you. And so they pray for you. Prayer is an expression of, of deep love. Because we're, we're asking for the Lord to, to lead. And sometimes we are pleading with the Lord to intervene. That, that his desires and that his purposes are fulfilled in the lives of those that we love. And so prayer for Paul is his way of turning God's people back over to God. anybody's expectations, but he knows that God is perfect and supreme and almighty, and so he, he hands people back over to God in intercession so that they would receive God's blessing, so that they would receive God's best for their lives. And so the things that Paul prays for are the best things that he can think of for the church. Then when he considers their situation and their circumstances and everything they're, they're facing, he, he prays for what is best for the church. And what makes his prayer for the Colossian church so remarkable is that Paul is himself writing from prison, right? He's, he's in Rome. He's, he's under house arrest. Uh, this is around 63 AD, and, uh, and Emperor Nero is, is reigning over Rome. So these are not good days. In, in, in worldly standpoints, this isn't Paul living his best life now. You know, thriving wouldn't exactly be a word that we could use for his circumstances if we were merely measuring his life by a worldly standard. And yet when you read Paul's writings, when you read his letters, you wouldn't know it. In fact, in, in the book of Philippians, which is a letter written at the same time period of Paul's life, Paul says that he's filled with joy because his circumstances are, are, are acting as an encouragement to his brothers and sisters in the faith so that, that they are more bold in their profession of faith. He says, I, I rejoice because by my imprisonment, the gospel is going forward and the, the guards who are guarding me and all of the Praetorian guard is, is knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And so in his affliction and in his imprisonment, Paul prays for those that are free. But he is concerned for their spiritual welfare. He, he, he knows that they have you know, freedom of access and movement and all the kinds of things that happen in daily life, but he is concerned for those areas of their life in which they are in spiritual bondage. And so we see in his pattern of writing, in his pattern of communicating, that the spiritual need always supersedes the material and the physical concerns. And that's why when we read about Paul, he doesn't want them to be ignorant of his circumstances and the things that he's going through, but he always adds them at the end. He, he puts the personal things at the end. He, he leads with the gospel things. He leads with the spiritual things. He, he wants to grab their attention by the things that matter to him, that matter to God, and that need to matter to us. And so he, he speaks of his imprisonment and his trials and his difficulties only as a footnote at the end. What makes Paul's prayer to the Colossian church even more remarkable than that is the uniqueness of their relationship. Colossians is a church uh, where Paul likely never visited. He, he was uh, not, when you look at his missionary journeys, never once did his path intersect with Colossae. And so um, this was a place that he likely never went to. In fact, we, we look at verse 7 and we find out that Epaphras is likely the man who uh, started the church there. He would have learned from Paul probably in Ephesus uh, about the gospel and, and been saved himself. And so he went to Colossae and he told the, the people there about Christ and they came to faith. And so he is the one that started the church there and now he has gone to visit Paul. And he's telling Paul about everything that's happening and he's relating to him the events that are taking place in the church and the things that God is doing. And as he is relating to him the things that he, is, uh, that he has to tell them about the church, we can see this mixture of excitement, that, that he's excited for the, the salvation of his friends. He's excited for the things that God is doing in their life. But he is concerned for their sanctification, that they are growing in godliness. And so when we read the book of Colossians, it's actually kind of hard to pin down precisely what the difficulty is that they're facing. But clearly one of the things that emerges is that the identity of Christ, who Jesus is, and what he has done has led to some confusion and, and maybe even attack from the outside. As with the other churches, Colossians, uh, the believers there, they're bombarded with all of the isms. They're, they're facing all of the worldviews that are, that are counter-biblical. Mysticism and uh, legalism and asceticism and Gnosticism, all of these things have, have come against the faith of these Christ followers. And so Paul here is focusing a great deal in Colossians on who Jesus is and what he has done. The city itself, the city of Colossae, is in decline. At one point, it was very prosperous. It was very prominent. But here at the time of Paul's writing, it is one of the, the smallest and one of the least important cities that Paul is going to write to. The whole region at one point was thriving under the fabric trade. Colossae was famous for its fabric dyes. But now all of this place is a, is a place where people are leaving and a place that people are forgetting. And yet Paul is not one of these. He, he writes to strengthen their faith, to, to remind the church that they are a part of God's family, that they are a part of God's bigger picture, but because of Jesus, that they also have a high calling to live out right where they are. That, they, that God has commissioned them, that God has, has sent them into this city, no, no matter how despondent it may be, with the hope of a Savior in Jesus Christ. And so we see the heart of an intercessor in Paul because first of all, when he thinks about them and when he considers their circumstance, when he hears all of the stories that Epaphras is telling him, we see that he constantly turns to prayer. He is constant in prayer. Look at verse three. It says, we give thanks to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And then skip ahead to verse 9. For this reason, because of all the things that God has been doing since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. We never stop. Every time we think about it, every time we think about what God has done in the life of the Colossian church, when we think about the believers there and what they are going through and the faithfulness that they have displayed, we can't stop 
praying for you to ask that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so we see a mindfulness. That's a part of the consistency in prayer. That, that he is aware of their circumstances. And so through Paul's prayer, we actually gain an insight into what has been done, namely this, the salvation that has taken root, and what still needs to be done, the work that is unfinished in their spiritual lives. And so in this constancy of prayer, the will of God is revealed. It's not that as he was writing this letter, he says, well, this is my prayer for the moment. Rather, this is a, a distillation of all of Paul's prayers for them, the things that just keep coming to his mind. As he thinks of them and constantly prays for him, there are, there are things that the Lord just continues to burden him with. I know you've experienced that, I've experienced that. It seems like somebody that we've been praying for for a long time that the Lord keeps us coming back to certain themes or certain events or certain issues in that person's life that he just brings to bear on our spirit so that we will keep on praying. And that's what God is doing here for Paul, that he is interceding on behalf of the church in Colossae. And there, as he is doing that, God is revealing to him his desire and his will for his church. And so it's important that Paul tells them what he is praying for them. That, that he doesn't just slide past the, the idea of prayer and, and, and say, you know, I'm praying for you, but he, he actually tells them what that he's praying for. Because what he wants to do is have them look in their lives and then in, in their relationship with God for the, the work of God, for the answer to those prayers. So that they know what to expect God to do in their lives. And we could just tell people that we're praying for them and move on. Or we could tell them what the Lord has us praying for them so that they can look at the work of God that is taking place within them, so that when they consider the circumstances that they face and the prayers that we are offering on their behalf, that we can expect the power of God to be at work for them. Instead of praying, and instead of saying, I'm, I'm praying for you, instead we could say, I'm praying for you this day as, you, as your coworker who's, who's hard on you and makes it difficult on you, that the Lord will give you the grace to love them. You know, son, I'm, I'm praying for you. Daughter, I'm praying for you as you go to school and that, that friend mistreats you. And that the Lord will give you the words to say and a heart to forgive. I'm praying for you as you're preparing for that meeting or praying for, preparing for that class or that presentation or that interview. I'm praying for you that the peace of God would be with you and that your confidence would be in his faithfulness. And when we pray like that, when we pray the way that, that Paul does, where, where, where others are praying for us in a similar way, it, it takes our focus off of the outcome. Now we're not just holding on for the answer to come, but now our focus has been redirected and we have refocused ourselves on God, our reliance on him and our trust in him. And so Paul, Paul here, he begins uh, speaking to the Colossians out of a heart of praise praise for what God has already done. And so the, the context of his prayer is thanksgiving for their salvation. He's just, he's just thankful to God for the work of salvation that has taken place in their lives. He says, uh, starting in verse 3 actually, he says, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you just as it has in all of the world also and is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. He says, since, since that moment where you really understood the grace of God, what it meant to be forgiven, it has, it has sprung up a, a source of life for you. And all of these other parts of your life have started to become real. He, he is praising God for the effect of the gospel. Why is Paul praying for them? Why, why is he writing to them? Why is he wanting to teach them? Why, why is he, he urging them? Well, it's because the saving power of God has already been at work within them. He, he's seeing the work of Christ in their salvation and in their day-to-day -day lives, and now he wants to encourage them to go even further. And so he's celebrating their salvation, that the same gospel that has been preached throughout the world has now found a home and has found a, a welcome in their hearts as well. That is the, the first and foremost important prayer. 
that the message of Jesus and his grace for sinners would bear the fruit of salvation in their hearts, in, in our hearts. And it stirs Paul's heart to pray and to praise when he sees it. And, and he tells them he knows that, they ha that their faith is real. He tells them it's because of what, he can, be, what can be observed about them, the, the reputation that has preceded them. If you look in verse 4, he says, I've heard about your faith in Christ and your love for his church. So, so Christ is at the center of their lives, and they love Christ's people. These are the hallmarks of the Christian faith, that Christ is in us, the hope of glory, and then Christ is working through us to love others the way that he has loved us. And, and that is what the believers in Colossae were known for. That is the report that Paul got. It's not like he was there seeing kind of half-hearted faith and half-hearted obedience. He, he, he comes to the, he's, he's not even observing what they're doing he, to, to give them the benefit of the doubt. This is the word that's coming to him. It's like, this is what people know about the believers in Colossae. Is that they have faith in Christ. That they love his church. In fact, the, the love that they have for one another is so strong, is so evident that Paul mentions it twice. In other words, Epaphras, was, when he was telling them about what's happening in that church, he, he constantly is talking about the love that they have for each other. It says in verse 8, after he's described this receiving of the gospel, he says, and he also, Epaphras, informed us of your love in the Spirit. He's describing the love that the church has for one another as a work of the Spirit, that it is a spiritually wrought place of love, not the affection that they have and the effect of the gospel in their lives. This new life and faith that they have in Jesus is that they love each other. Lastly, Epaphras reports to Paul just how firmly they hold to their heavenly hope. How firmly they hold to their heavenly hope. And so Paul is thankful for their firmness, third of all, in the hope that they have in his promise. In verse 5, we see that their security, what, that they relied on, what they trusted in, their constant source of hope was the promise that Jesus had given. That this world is not all for which we live. In all of the other letters that, that Paul is writing, he, he, he uses the eternal view, the eternal vantage point as a teaching tool. And, and there, it's all a, a part of the theology section. He's trying to remind them, church, don't get caught up in the world. Remember, there's something greater than this. There's something after this. There's something after that's much more important than this. But when he talks to the Colossian church, it's in the section on gratitude. Because for them, this part of the gospel that... There is an eternal promise laid up for them in heaven. This is the word of God that they are clinging to. These are the words that Jesus said that they are holding fast to. In fact, if we look together in John chapter 14, we see exactly what Jesus promised. In John chapter 14, he is preparing his disciples for his departure. So there are, there are hard days coming. There are sad days coming. There are trials that are ahead of them. And Jesus knows this. And so he's preparing them. In John chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. Now that's, that's what they're anticipating. That's what they're waiting for. It, Jesus wraps up his, uh, his encouragement to them in, in John 16, verse 33. These things that I have spoken to you so that, you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Take courage, I have overcome the world. That's the promise that the Colossian church is holding to, is that Christ has overcome the world. And in, in Christ, we are overcomers as well. And when I read his introduction to the book of Colossians, I can't help but be struck with the parallel. The parallel of the effect of the gospel in Colossians with what the Holy Spirit reveals to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians is written about 10 years before the book of Colossians, and it shows that these, these elements of 
their faith, their faith and their love and their hope that these aren't just random pieces of Christian theology, but rather that they are the core elements of a sincere faith. He's saying, when I, when I hear these three, three things about you, that's how I know that you have come to understand the grace of God in truth. He says this is like an authentication that your life has been transformed. That whoever you were before, whatever you did before, whatever your past life was, when there are faith and hope and love, that's how I know that you have been transformed by the love of Jesus. And so when Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, he is differentiating between those things that are temporal and those that are eternal. The things that are going to pass away and the things that are going to persist. And he says that some of the things, some of the visible things, even some of the miraculous elements of the Christian life that has lived on this world, whether it's prophecy, speaking in tongues, or words of knowledge, these things are going to pass away. These things will not transcend this life. But he says this in verse 13. But now faith, hope, love. Abide these three but the greatest of these is love. So 10 years later, Paul hears about the believers in Colossae and he writes to them saying, I know that Christ lives in you. I know the spirit of God is transforming you because faith, love, and hope abide in you. And I just, I just thank God. I, I praise God. I am continually in prayer, thanking the Lord for saving you that the fruit of his salvation is continually bearing fruit in your lives. And the question that I asked myself as I was reading this is, is why, why does Paul say all this? Like, why, why rehash it? I mean, he's literally telling the people that they already know. It's about them. And along with all of the other reasons that I've mentioned this morning, another reason is simply to let them know that they have the gospel that they have eternal life because they have Jesus and Jesus is enough. It's another way to encourage a believer that, that, there, that there isn't anything more out there, that they're not missing something, that there isn't some secret knowledge or secret experience. There aren't some secrets that exceed their relationship with Christ that they need to go and find because, that's, because Jesus is everything. To have Jesus is to have everything. That's why Paul gives his clearest teaching on Christ in Colossians. He wants us to know who Jesus is and what he has done. And later on, as we're going to read, uh, we find out that, that, that Paul is specifically encouraging them. He says, I don't want you to be taken captive by, by philosophy and empty deception, by the traditions of men according to the elementary philosophies of this world, rather than according to Christ. I, I, I want you to not be held by the things of this world. I want you to be held by Christ. And he warns them that they should not let anyone defraud them or rob them or steal from them this prize, that though there are false teachers who promote false humility, who promote the worship of angelic beings and are puffed up by their visions and the sense of self-importance, Instead, Paul settles the believer's hearts and minds by instructing us, by, by setting ourselves upon Christ, setting our minds on heavenly things, because Jesus is everything. In church, we have Jesus. And so this assurance that Paul gives, reminding them of what they have, it gives them peace to know that the incomparable Christ is the source of incorruptible faith, love, and hope. And that is the word that the church needed to hear. It's the word that we need to hear. It's, it's the thing that we need to hold on to most because life is too unpredictable to leave our relationship with Jesus unresolved and unsettled. He's speaking to the, to the believers in Colossae. and saying, you need to hear this. You need to, to know and remember that Jesus is everything. And it seems like Paul's letter could not have been more timely. Eusebius, church historian, he records that the city of Colossae was destroyed in an earthquake shortly after receiving this letter. That's why we don't read about 
Colossians and Revelation. We don't read about Colossians uh, down the road when we hear about other churches and, and their activity because the church in Colossae was destroyed. And those believers that perished, they did so knowing that Jesus was God and that only he is able to save them eternally. A letter that was written less than a year before grounded them. It, it brought them to the place of reminding them that Jesus was everything and that uh, chasing after imaginary things and, and, the, and the wisdom of the world and, and the philosophy that, that led away from Christ was a dead end that did not give life. It's, it's the message that we need so that we are settled in Christ as well. Because we've just seen in the last week how our world can be turned upside down. We think of our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who a week ago, their lives were thrown into chaos. Whatever their sense of equilibrium, whatever their sense of peace, whatever their anticipation of struggle and persecution, it exploded a, a thousand times fold. And church, we lost brothers and sisters. We lost them from this world, but we have not lost them in eternity. The scripture reminds us that we're going to see them and that they are honored for their martyrdom. It's time for us to to pause and ask ourselves the question. If someone were to write our biography, if like Epaphras, someone were to follow us around and they were to watch our daily activities and, and to see what we focus on and where our priorities are, could the same be said of us that was said of the Colossian church? Could they report that our, our lives are defined by our faith in Jesus? that his work is evident in the love that we have for the church around us and that our hearts are set on heaven and we won't settle for earth. Let me invite our worship team to come and close our service and then Joe will pray and dismiss us. But let me pray for us as we close our time here right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that even an introduction, even just a few sentences of reminding a church of who they are and what they have in you can have such a profound effect on us because we so easily move on. We so easily move on to what is next and what is more that we lose sight of what is everything. And so today, Lord, I pray that you would just ground us and that you would bring us back to home base. That in our life we would see the faith of salvation, the faith in Christ. That in, in our lives we would love our brothers and sisters dearly. And that in our perspective and in our priorities of living, that our hope would be firmly fixed in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.